I hope I'm online. And people are joining in between. Waiting a little bit so that people can join and then we can start. Hey, hi. Hi, Hemant. I can see you. Okay, so today's topic is techniques in biology, right? So we would explore several molecular biology techniques, we would explore several biophysical techniques, biochem related techniques, and all of these things, right? Okay, so this is going to be today's agenda. And next one and a half hour, we are going to at least look at it. It's a very important topic for IIT Jam or any other examination at MSc level. Forget about MSc level examination. Just just to know about these techniques are important because when you choose a career in academia, you have to do. Okay, I don't actually remember you right now, but glad you also found me in YouTube. So great. So we're going to talk about the enzymes which are frequently used but i'm waiting for people to join a little bit and then we can go and talk about all of these things okay uh, i should have given some intros yeah so this is going to be the outline of today's topic the topic that we are going to cover so first half at least first 20 minute we plan to cover the enzymes which are frequently used in recombinant dna technology or any molecular biology related topic second we are going to talk about methods to study protein protein interaction and studying dna protein interaction and we would learn all the methods underlying this broad heading we are going to talk about working with protein in that we are going to talk about sds page western blot etc and i'll try to go as slow as possible such that you guys can understand and i don't i don't sound gibberish while we are doing this while we are studying all of these things i don't know how much we can cover today but while we are doing this what we can do is try to solve previous year question and that would give us an idea that what depth we need to really cover such that uh, we can really perform well in the exam so this is the overall plan today but i'm still waiting at least five minutes such that people can join because it's not even five minutes right now so i think people would be joining and people always take some time to join if nobody joins we would cover and probably they would be re uh, watching the repeat bot broadcast and all those things so yeah waiting a little bit hemant so these courses are actually present in an academy as well i mean these are the trailer for what we do in an academy plus platform but this is a small snapshot into it which are things which are uh, very um elaborate there hi ashia so if you want to join there in plus classes you can also join i see people are coming in one by one i'll wait for five minutes and then we can start such that people can understand whatever you see in the screen is the learning agenda today we can even cover more or less based on the time as the time permits or we can cover it if you guys like this particular topic so we can really take our time to finish all of these topics maybe i can give a class on february a little bit to finish everything and any po point of time if you think i'm like going really fast tell me that you're going fast you need to slow down and accordingly i'll modulate the space for the class okay and if you think you guys don't understand english that well which i expect you guys understand because the exam is in english uh, you have to communicate your science in english so you should understand english but if you still think you can't understand english i would repeat i would try to go over slowly i would prefer not to talk in hindi but i can still give it a shot because my hindi is horrible anyway 
so waiting still waiting a little bit time maybe i can do my commercials just like a just like before a flight this air hostess does all these commercial safety rules i can also start all of these things like at the end of this course you would be feeling more confident in the day of exam having deeper understanding to the subject is necessary such that you can plan better and my classes would help you to boost uh, boost your analytical skills now in an academy plus platform we are also revising these courses simultaneously we are done with cell biology immunology molecular biology and biotechnology part so that was our first milestone that we wanted to achieve till jan 15th and we have done it and everybody knows who are uh, in the plus platform we have done that part we have revised with specific notes we have done so many tests all of these things second milestone is to achieve the key aspect is like biochemistry and physiology then the microbiology part and the general biology i don't know whether we are going to cover that or not so this is going on in the plus platform so if you guys are interested you guys can all, all already join there things are way slower and way chilled in that situation but uh, the youtube classes are also equally good yeah so the things are way methodological in these plus courses and you can also uh, take part in the mega quiz or the quiz what you need to take part for your exam and these are particularly very useful according to my knowledge because i try to keep the question as close to as the exam point of view not something random information based karna tha kar diya aise type ka nahi so these are like very well organized test series or um courses and each of these lectures are done in a fashion that it would augment your learning skill at the same time don't make you feel too much bored and the graphics are really optimum no copyright graphics all are freshly designed graphics anyway you can always subscribe to the jam channel of it uh, for uh, an academy and please hit the bell icon such that i you can also get notification when i'm online and you know my code ap10 is for 10% discount you can always go to the plus platform for discount i think now 5 minute is over and my commercial break is also over so i should now start otherwise people would move away okay now starting the part so first we are going to talk about the enzymes which are frequently used in recombinant dna technology most of you guys might be knowing all of these enzymes so what i'm going to do is not make you feel bored but i would like try to interact with you as much as possible so prepare to interact and such that we can do it okay so first of all recombinant dna technology is like full of uh, hi so recombinant dna technology is full of enzymatic assays and many of the enzymes are used in recombinant dna technology right so we are going to see one by one what enzymes are used so what comes in your mind when we talk about recombinant dna technology first of all there would be a lot of genetic changes plasmids you put your gene inside you do something do some change in the molecular level all of these things come in our mind right if we have a healthy mind and we know about what is recombinant dna technology so i have a problem with the name so the name is recombinant dna technology because you create a recombinant that is fine but this is like day to day molecular biology experiments so let's see so first of all we have our molecular scissors which i don't have to tell you is restriction enzymes and your glue which is ligase which is which i also don't have to tell you but you guys already know these things so we'll focus more application oriented situation and how you can use that what are the principles that these enzymes are used for so first let's talk about uh, the outline how we are going which enzymes we are looking at so first we are looking at restriction endonucleases okay then we are going to look at t4 dna ligase dna pol1 clinofragment alkaline phosphatase and polynucleotide kinase reverse transcriptase then rnas a dnas1 rnas h etc so this is the overall thing that we are going to cover in next 20 minutes so let's let's start so you guys are ready give me some responses such that i can understand give me some responses guys ha 
Hello, you guys are with me. Or what is happening? Okay. Even if you guys are not with me, I'll start. So I'm going to start with restriction endonuclease. And I don't have to remind you what is restriction endonuclease because you guys already know, right? But few things just for a revision purpose. If we know our cloning workflow, you have your plasmid. Not necessary, it need to be a plasmid, but most popularly it's a plasmid. It could be a fudge vector as well. Most popularly it is plasmid. And then you digest the plasmid with proper restriction enzyme. And you also clean up the vector. Then what you do is you cleave your gene of interest with the same restriction enzyme that you have digested your plasmid with and it would create sticky ends and then the step is ligation basically use a t4 dna ligase which is the most popular version of the ligase and we'll see how a ligase enzyme work and then you join them after that you try to do a step which is called transformation reaction bacterial transformation reaction then what you do is try to get your vectors inside your bacteria now as the bacteria grows your vectors are also growing right or your gene of interest is also amplifying in a sense multiple clones of your gene of interest is produced and that is why this is the basic overall framework of the molecular cloning and the key aspects that are used is restriction endonuclease and the ligase dna ligase now let me tell you Restriction endonuclease and DNA ligase is not the only thing that you need to use for cloning. There are cloning methods which are more recently developed which doesn't even need restriction endonuclease or ligase. Let's pause for a moment. You would be saying, what? What are you saying? We, we so far know that, okay, you need to cut it with restriction endonuclease. You need to ligate it with DNA ligase. And you're saying that, you don't need restriction endonuclease or ligase at all how that is possible yeah it is possible and at the end of this lecture maybe we are going to talk about it a little bit such that you guys know and get a unique flavor of this class about the current and adv advancement so let's move on so this is your dna and the whole goal is the restriction endonuclease would bind to a specific region of this dna and cut that right so it is molecular caesar but at the same time you should understand that restriction endonuclease is not cutting the bacterial dna even though they are found in the bacteria most of the restriction endonuclease are isolated from the bacteria for example the first restriction endonuclease which was isolated from the bacteria does anybody know about the name which was the first restriction endonuclease which was isolated from the bacteria and which bacteria is it Any idea guys? You guys are preparing for jam. I mean you don't need to know this information. You can always we I mean Google it. But anyway, do you guys know? Okay. Looks like you guys don't know. So the first restriction endonuclease which was discovered was a type 3 restriction endonuclease, which is Hind 3 and isolated from Haemophilus influenzae. Okay? No, it was not E. coli. So first you should ask that, okay, if restriction ends in the nucleases, which are capable of cleaving DNA, working like a molecular caesar, is going to cut the DNA. But why it is present in the bacteria? Why it is not cutting the bacterial DNA? Any guess? Any guess on that? Why it is not cutting the bacterial DNA? Even though it is present in the bacteria, we are purifying it from the bacteria, but it is not cutting the bacterial DNA. How is it possible? So scientists really bothered about this thing. Many PhD students like me, like really scratch their head to understand how it happens. And eventually what they figured out is that the bacteria is mostly infected by the phage virus and the phage is the killer for the bacteria. So they have developed this restriction endonuclease enzyme as a defense system, a so-called immune system. But the question still remains, why in restriction endonuclease, which are present in the bacteria, does not cleave its own DNA? Because bacterial own DNA is protected somehow. And a protection mark is a methylation mark, which 
which sends the restriction enzyme a signal that do not engage, it is my own DNA. And this kind of strategy we very often see when we learn about immunology, right? We have immune system and we we teach our immune system such that don't attack our self antigens or don't recognize our self self antigens and destroy us. So that is how this is very similar to the immune system. That reminds me that I have two lecture which covers quite a lot of part of the immune system and immunology in details present in An Academy's YouTube live page. You guys, if you don't uh, ha haven't yet uh, looked at it, you can take a look at it. And we have also looked at the question that are asked from those parts. Okay, out of the many restriction enzymes which are uh, discovered sequentially, the key ones are categorized in three types. Out of that, type 2 restriction endonuclease enzymes are of our interest because they have a site specific cleaving function, right? What does site specific cleaving function mean? So if it recognizes a site, it would cleave at the site, not some place away from the site. It turns out the other two restriction endonucleases which were discovered early, like type 3 or type 1, though it recognizes a specific restriction site, but it does not cut there. It cut around the site and away from that side. So that was a problem for scientists because they really cannot manipulate or really cannot predict that which site it is going to cut and there is no predictability. Until and unless type 2 restriction enzyme was used, it was never thought that they, they, they can use this enzyme to clone DNA or clone your gene of interest. Now restriction Type 3 endonucleases can produce two types of ends, which again you guys already know. So just to revise, uh, they have the sticky ends, they have the blunt ends. Both of the possibilities could be there. Now sticky ends are always good. I mean, though sticky ends and blunt end both are capable of ligating to each other with the help of ligase enzyme, but the sticky ends are always better in terms of ligation. Okay. So since we talked ligation, let's transit into the DNA ligase and how does DNA ligase work. So DNA ligase actually catalyze the formation of the last phosphodiester bond between what? Between the 3 prime hydroxyl group here and the 5 prime phosphate. Between the 3 prime hydroxyl and the 5 prime phosphate. So that is the job of DNA ligase, forming a last terminal phosphodiester bond to really seal the gaps and if you learn about replication you already know that how these ligation enzyme is really useful to fill up the gaps which is present in the Okazaki fragments right so here is our DNA ligase sitting onto the last unsynthesized base and what it's, it's going to do is using a ATP and in an mg2 plus dependent manner it would form the last bond okay or last phosphodiester bond where the hydroxyl group work like a nucleophil so give me some time since after we finish this lecture at least this overview we're going to go back and look at how ligase enzyme really works because people have asked question on the mechanism of ligase ac action in the iit jam or in jnu i have also seen next come the dna paul cleno fragment I don't have to introduce you to the DNA Paul enzyme because you guys know DNA Paul was Kornberg's enzyme, right? Discovered by Arthur Kornberg. And they thought that DNA polymerase 1 was the first and the key restriction, uh, sorry, the key polymerase enzyme inside a bacteria. But it turns out later, later on, DNA Paul 3 is the key polymerase, not the DNA Paul 1. How did they figure out? I'll tell you a small story because it's a transition story. It turns out if we take a little bit break and in break we just learn about some stories about some scientists and their thought, thought processes, our lecture would be really productive and it would be not monotonous and boring and not information heavy. Though we have to provide a lot of information in these lectures. So Arthur Kornberg was pretty confident that um, DNA Paul 1 was the key restriction enzyme because he was a biochemist. 
whenever he put DNA pol 1, which was purified, and put some purified DNA, DNTPs, and magnesium chloride, then he see that replication processes can take place. His friends say, no, I'm a geneticist. I won't believe these things until and unless you show me in a mutant. So he didn't throw his friend's word totally. So he, he was pretty confident, but he made a mutant. A mutant of DNA Pol 1. He expected that since it's a key enzyme for DNA replication, if I make a mutant of it, I won't see any replicate replication uh, products there and that day the way they used to detect replication is happening or not is like radio level nucleotide and seeing the radioactivity building up over time so that was their assay what he found out that when he gets rid of dna pol 1 nothing is happening in a cell in that e coli which is a mutant of dna pol 1 the replication is happening properly there is no problem that means there is something to give backup in an absence of DNA Pol 1. And that led to the discovery of DNA Pol 3, which was discovered later. Initially, DNA Pol 1 was the key replication enzyme people thought about it. 10 years later, it was discovered. Okay, story time is over. All of these context was really provided to make you feel more interested about the function of DNA Pol 1 and how we can use it. DNA Pol 1 can be used in several aspects. Before knowing that, let's look at the domains of the DNA Pol 1. So it would really give us an idea that which domain does what. So it has a forward polymerase activity like any other polymerase, like Pol 3 or Pol other polymerases, right? So in five time to five prime to three prime direction, it would add new nucleotides and elongate the chain. But it can only elongate the chain when there is a three prime OH present. It can only elongate, right? It cannot nucleate. And that's why you need primase activity. Anyway, it also have a backward exonuclease activity. And this exonuclease activity ensures if a wrong base is incorporated during this elongation process, it would be removed then and there because it would produce a kink or a bump in the uh, selected uh, newly synthesized DNA strand. And that is detected by this enzyme and it's going to come back, chop that off and again resynthesize. Third activity is a 5' prime to 3' prime forward exonuclease activity. That means you go in the forward direction, you break it and you bridge it. So you break in the forward direction and you can also make it in the forward direction using 5' prime to 3' prime polymerase activity. So these three possible activities are present in DNA Pol 1 in three different domains nicely segregated. None of these functionalities are overlapping between the domains. So it is legitimate to get rid of one of these domains. So what scientists did, they got rid of the 5' prime to 3' prime forward exonuclease activity or the domain that give rise to forward exonuclease activity. What they really found that that is beneficial and using that, they've create the DNA Pol 1 large fragment or the clino fragment. Now clino fragment is widely used to fill up 5' prime and the 3' prime overhangs, but what are overhangs? It looks like a staggered end, but why it is important, I'll come in a moment. It can also be used to prepare radioactive DNA probes and labeling of the DNA. So in these two aspects, we are going to talk about, okay? So let's talk about the filling. So here we have a vector. Unfortunately, we didn't get a matching restriction site in the vector and the insert. And we have to cut the vector with a blunt restriction enzyme. So a blunt end is produced in case of this restriction vector, right? As in this, uh, yeah, in this, in this vector. Now the problem is, if you have a blunt end, a sticky end is not going to ligate with a blunt end, right? So you definitely need a blunt end to ligate with a blunt end. Now either you can do two things, creating an overhang in these vectors such that it it's binding with the sticky end which is our insert or otherwise you can chop off the sticky ends and make the product uh, make the insert blunt so every choice is in your hand now one possibility is we can chop off the insert right and really make it blunt and that can be achieved by dna pol 1 clenofragment so dna pol 1 clenofragment can really make 
it blunt and let's see how. So this is our three prime overhang. Here what happens at the five prime end, I mean, he, here your DNA pole one is binding at these uh, ends, right? Okay. So at this particular situation, what it can does, it can move from a five prime to three prime direction. So as it move from a five prime to three prime direction, it would chop off the tails, right? Next, it can also fill in the templates by using its polymerase activity, right? Depending upon it's a five prime overhang or a three prime overhang, it can put new nucleotides to fill up or it can chop off the existing nucleotide which is a overhang. Both the cases, at the end of using this DNA pole one clenofragment, you get blunt products and these blunt products can really easily be cloned into the blunt end restriction digested vector and using a normal um, method of transformation you can put this thing inside the bacteria and in overnight you can get recombinant colonies however i'm not focusing too much about the type of vectors here or all of these things maybe i'll discuss that in a different class if i get quite a lot of likes and quite a lot of watch time with from you guys then we would decide anyway we move on to the next enzyme and before that i wanted to ask that you guys are with me or not or you guys are sleeping so what is the situation it's a winter evening so the general default state that you guys are sleepy so tell me what is the situation write me in the comment section come on guys okay so we move forward a little bit so we're going to talk about alkaline phosphatase and polynucleotide kinase both these enzymes are used frequently in molecular biology lab in next five minutes we would learn how they are used in molecular biology lab okay okay so i mean when we talk about a molecular biology lab which is doing cloning they really use it every day and I also use it frequently in my own PhD studies. So let's see what happens. So this is my vector. I can restriction digest my vector with a restriction enzyme and it would give rise to what it would give rise to. It would give rise to like a restriction product. Now you have a five prime phosphate group here, what you can see, and you have a three prime hydroxyl group in each of these cases. Now, if you have a ligation uh, enzyme, these things could be ligated. But that's in theory. But if you keep this uh, vector in a digested format for a long time in a tube, what would happen? These nucleophiles, which are present in the the nucleophiles, which are present in the OH group, here these are nucleophiles, right? These can actually hit the phosphate core and form the reform the phosph phosphodiester bond okay so this thing can happen if you keep it long non-enzymatic so maybe if let's say there are 100 molecules of these vectors present imagine in the tube so let's say 20 percent of them can also self ligate but we don't want them to self ligate we want them to stay in an open conformation for long until and unless we put our insert so a trick that molecular biologists play is the following. So in order to prevent re-ligation, because what they do is they put your they put your put uh, your construct. Now your construct could be different, but your backbone might be same. For example, imagine a truck. A truck is delivering your concept, uh, uh, your stuff from here to there. So your truck is same. The stuff of your interest or the product of your interest could be different. Similarly, in cloning reaction, what happens in day to day, your vectors are similar and you know this is a good vector, good carrying capacity, good propagation system. So I'll be using this vector only. So you keep it in your fridge. Now what happens if you if you have a uh, re-ligation possibilities, so it would give rise to non recombinants We can screen that, but it's not legitimate, right? So you use alkaline phosphatase, which would chop off the 5' hydroxyl group. 
and now the vectors has only hydroxyl group in all 5 prime and 3 prime ends so even if there are free nucleophiles it cannot hit the other center because all of these are nucleophilic centers right so it cannot hit a nucleophilic center a nucleophile cannot hit a nucleophilic center anyway so there would be no possibility of re-ligation so it can it has a now fridge uh, shelf life i would say so it could be stored for a long time so that's great then what happens then what happens let's say you have an insert which you are pcr amplifying from a particular dna strand right and this pcr ampli amplicon would also have two things the pcr amplicon would have the 5 prime phosphate and 3 prime oh and that's a normal scheme for any dna strands what you use is put polynucleotide kinase so instead of this hydroxyl group in the 3 prime you put phosphate group using polynucleotide kinase and polynucleotide kinase works with the help of atp and as a result it would take the phosphate group from the atp form adp and form a phosphate group there uh, both the sides okay both the sides are the same so let me draw this phosphate group for you i'm horrible at drawing but still i'm drawing Now I'm horrible at drawing when I don't have my pen working. My pen is not working at this moment. Okay, so now you can understand. In the insert, everything is phosphate group. In the vector, everything is hydroxyl group. That means what? These nucleophile can attack these centers, right? So and again, your phosphodiester bond could be formed. So this ensures that self ligated products are less generated and mostly you get recombinant dna as a product right so you clearly understood how you can use polynucleotide kinase and alkaline phosphatase in combination to serve a particular purpose in the cloning okay so it not only gives you a better cloning but it also increases the efficiency of the cloning and give you a better chance of getting a recombinant okay now we are going to talk about end labeling procedure which is i mean once upon a time during 1970s to 1990s the golden era of bio biochemistry they used to use every lab used to use pnk and alkaline phosphatase to label the end of the dna making radioactive probes and all so next topic is to how we should make a radioactive probe using this dna so here is our dna let's say this particular dna from here we are going to make a probe okay so but this DNA is unlabeled, so it won't be detected. So let's see how we can make the probe. First, we would treat it with the alkaline phosphatase. As a result, we know these phosphate groups, which are in the 5' prime direction, they are going to be chopped off and hydroxyl group would be there right now. Now, in that region, we can put radioactive nucleotides or radioactive ATP along with polynucleotide kinase. Now polynucleotide kinase take the gamma ATP of the gamma phosphate of the ATP and put it in the 5 prime OH group and now if it is radioactive so it is incorporating a radioactive label in the 5 prime ends only so the 5 prime ends would be radio labeled and this is a widely used procedure by which you can label the 5 prime end you can use also other radioactive levels in the gamma phosphate but this, that is important and as a result what is happening you can create I mean radioactive phosphate leveled uh, probes which you can use for several hybridization process such as in situ hybridization such as southern blotting northern blotting etc so we learn that how we can use alkaline phosphatase to make alkaline phosphatase and a combination of polynucleotide kinase to label the ends of the dna or let's say uh, how we can use efficient how we can use that to increase the efficiency of the cloning and all of these purposes okay so i hope you guys understand this part so we shall move on but before that give me some indication in the chat such that i i know okay so if you guys are not replying so i'll or maybe there is a lag in between the server so that's why um, the reply is arriving later 
So we're going to talk about micrococcal nucleus next because it's an endonuclease enzyme which preference, preferen, uh, preferentially digests single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA, especially at AT or AU regions. And only this much you need to know for IIT jam, not more than that. Most of the cases they give these things as a um, question which are like uh, which are related to molecular biology or maybe biotechnology, but column matching questions is a favorite for them. Okay, so micrococcal nucleus can bind from the end and really cleave a single stranded DNA or RNA, specifically at AT or AU regions. Now, RNAs A is another enzyme which is frequently used to get rid of the RNA in a DNA sample, right? So, as the name suggests, RNAs A, that means it would get rid of RNAs, RNA or not the DNA, right? So, RNAs A worked again with a specific acid base catalysis reaction. So, they form a small intermediate and followed by the RNA is chopped off. We don't focus too much on that, but let's say you have isolated some plasmids and you want the plasmid DNA alone and you want to do some cloning and cloning work from this plasmid DNA. So you don't need a RNA contamination in your plasmid DNA. It is not good, right? If you have a RNA contamination in your plasmid DNA. So then what you're going to do is going to put RNAs A and get rid of that. There is another cousin member of RNA which is known as ribonuclease H or RNAs H. RNAs H is very useful in context, at, at least at the initial days, it was very useful for the context of reverse transcription. It can get rid of the RNA in a RNA DNA hybrid. So, reverse transcription is a process by which you can create DNA from the RNA, right? And you need to get Eventually, you need to get rid of the RNA, which is served as a template, but it, you need to get rid of that. And that usually is done by RNAs H. Next, coming to DNAs, as the name suggests, it is used to get rid of the DNA contamination in an RNA sample. Okay, let's take a live example again. Let's say you have extracted RNA, total RNA, and you expect you have a lot of purified RNA, but unfortunately, you have some DNA conflict contamination as well in order to get rid of the DNA contamination and ensuring your uh, cDNA doesn't have a contamination of genomic DNA you get rid of it, get rid of it with DNAs 1 before you try to make the cDNA now if you have a contamination of genomic DNA in this cDNA sample which is derived from this RNA it's a detrimental situation because in quantitative real-time PCR you never know that where are you amplifying from, from a genomic DNA or the cDNA, which is derived from RNA. So this can give you misleading results. So that's why you don't need your cDNA sample to be contaminated with DNA and you treat it with DNA. That's a normal thing people do frequently in the molecular biology labs. Okay. So last step, which we are not going to focus in too much details, but it's like the uh, reverse transcriptase enzyme. So it can use several uh, anchor points such as oligo -DT primer or a random hexamer primer after which it can put its own uh, nucleotides and as a result it would form the dna out of this rna and this is the ba basis of the reverse transcriptase pcr you use the same reverse transcriptase enzyme to perform this and ultimately you create your cdna from a single stranded rna right so we are pretty much with this particular topic of uh, enzymes that are frequently used in molecular biology. So next we move on to our second topic, right? So let's see for a moment what was our second topic. Our second topic was most likely methods to study DNA protein interaction, right? Methods to study DNA protein interaction was our next topic. Okay. Okay. So we have covered this thing in a span of half an hour, which was not a too much pace, I think. So let's take a 15 minute time to understand the methods to study protein DNA interaction. So this is a very uh, common question that people have used 
I, I mean, people have asked in other IIT Jam question. In a moment, we are going to be clear with this. So stay tuned for 20 next minutes, and then we are going to solve the question. And these kind of questions are frequently asked in any type of uh, exams, okay? So first thing, we are going to start our journey to understand DNA protein interaction from very cheap assays like electrophoretic mobility shift assay. We know how gel electrophoresis work, right? So now if you give a DNA, you are going to get a corresponding band in the gel depending upon its size. But let's say a bulky stuff is associated with the DNA. Then its mobility inside the gel would be inhibited, right? Or at least hampered, somehow interfered. So it's not able to move as it possibly can do in an uninhibited state. So let's say you get a band when we only run the DNA here. Okay, so, so this is the situation when you only run the DNA. Your hypothesis is a particular protein is binding to this DNA region and it does some stuff. Okay, so in order to understand that, what you are going to do is put the protein with this solution and run the solution again in the gel. And let's see what we see in the gel. We saw a band pattern like this. This is our region of interest where we should get our DNA because our DNA is this bigger. Let's say a 200 base pair. But we see a very faint band there. Instead, an intense band is present up here which is in a higher molecular weight or higher length in terms of base pair, right? So there is a shift of the bands, right? Now, that means the band is about to be formed at 200 base pair that is expected, but when we added this protein, it is retarded in the gel. That means what? That means since the protein is binding to the DNA, it leads to the retardation and it's a gross proof that okay this DNA portion is actually binding with the protein of interest. Now in order to get a control what you can do is you can give a different DNA which is very different from this blue DNA right and like you can make this DNA differently and let's say this particular DNA this orange DNA is unlabeled okay this orange DNA is unlabeled, but this blue DNA is labeled. So what you're going to see, you're going to see a band corresponding to this blue DNA, but not this orange here. So this is your positive control kind of experiment, which is not so important to understand at this moment. But whenever you design any experiment, you need to have a solid positive and a negative control to prove your experiment. So next we talk about DNA's footprinting assay. So there are several particular DNA binding proteins which can bind to the major and the minor groove of the DNA, okay? And that is how they can cause changes in the DNA. Who are these DNA binding proteins? So can you give me example of few DNA binding proteins? I know you guys can definitely tell me, okay, transcription factors. Apart from transcription factors, give me some example of DNA binding protein. Come on, I'm waiting for your reply in the chat. Okay, so we can talk about transcription factors. We can talk about enhance. I mean, specific, uh, let's say, mediators, repressors, other regulators, which can bind to the DNA, right? So let's say you're walking in the seashore. You'd leave your footprint on the seashore, right? Now, as if it's a mark that on this particular region you have walked. In terms of DNA, while a transcription factor bind, it kind of leave its footprint. Yeah, Tarabox binding protein is also a transcription factor. It's a generalized transcription factor of TF2D family. Data box binding factor is a segment of the TF2D transcription factor. It has two no 
I mean two regions one is called TBP TBP's DNA binding ability is very different from the normal DNA binding proteins and there is another region for tata box binding protein which is called transcription activation factor TAF TAF and TBP are the two regions so anyway good since you answered now let's say here here this is TBP and whenever it bind to the DNA it would leave a footprint how is the footprint possible so let's say if you restriction digest this in uh, this uh, particular DNA fragment you would get all sort of fragments and if these DNA is labeled you can get some band in the autoradiogram or even gels in the band uh, bands in the gel anyway now what you're going to do is put your protein of suspected protein and let's say this is, has a DNA binding function and then you digest with the same set of restriction enzymes and try to run it again in the autoradiogram develop it in an autoradiogram that use people used to do earlier or now run a gel and develop that gel so what they are going to do or they're going to find is like there is a vacant portion this vacant portion is corresponding to the footprint that means this particular dna binding protein is providing a footprint where it is binding right okay and exactly this is a particular uh, particular dna binding uh, region here which you, whose sequence information you can get a rough idea about and this figure is taken from a journal whose permission is already taken so it's not my image or i have cr created or uh, sort of like uh, expect any kind of credit for that this is taken from a journal with a proper permission so what you can see samples in the lane 4 there is a vacancy whereas in the lane 3 or lane 2 the bands are fainter in that region right so it looks like 2 and 3 has some amount of dna binding but very less so you have a faint band than the control which is the lane 1 but still you don't have too much so that gives you an idea that how it works now we go to a more uh, complicated one which is known as chip sick or chromatin immunoprecipitation following by sequencing now this is a method that can be used in vivo the earlier two methods are actually used mostly in vitro now chip seek is a method which could be used in vivo majorly but you can also modulate the system to work in in vivo in vitro as well so chip seek can be both in vitro in vivo anything so you need some clue so let's see how the process is depend i mean what is the process dependent on so this method is used to study dna protein inter uh, interaction in vivo or in vitro and when we talk about a gene so this particular technique would give you an ex give you an idea that this particular dna binding protein where it is binding in our genome so our genome has quite a lot of genes right now our transcription factor or a particular protein which has a dna binding function can bind to several genomic location and it is almost impossible to take the whole all of the genomic location and try to run a pcr or try to run a emsa for that it's impossible with the existing techniques that we have learned so we need a global analysis technique so let's see what you do but let me remind you inside the eukaryotes the gene is not a segment of dna it is actually a portion of chromatin which is wrapped around the histones right so what you're going to do is going to first isolate or precipitate this chromatin so that's why the name is chromatin immunoprecipitation now your protein of interest can bind to that particular dna region or many other particular dna region you don't know you don't have any expectation you want to find out that which possible genomic location it binds to for example this yellow portion this green portion are actually indicative of different genomic location and different genes it's possible that your transcription factor is controlling several genes okay so what you're going to do as a first step is try to pull down this transcription factor with the antibody coated beads this is the first and the foremost uh, condition to do a chip seek experiment so you need to have a antibody coated bead and you need to have an antibody against your protein of interest otherwise you cannot perform this assay 
okay once you pull down and centrifuge what you're going to do either you can do a centrifuge or if it's a magnetic bead instead of an agarose bead you can also magnetic separate them and as a result what you're going to see in the pull down fraction you're going to take out the pull down fraction and run it on a western blot okay either you can do a western blot or what you're going to just to understand that you have the chromatin pulled down or not that's a positive confirmation and then you get rid of those proteins and run a particular sequencing experiment right this sequencing experiment would tell you the genomic regions which are pulled down with the transcription factor is mapping to which genomic region so this is how the chip sick workflow looks like so you have the chip sick chip sick experiment where you pull down your chromatin of interest with the antibody coated bead you cross check that the pull down happened properly by cross checking a western blot against this particular histone fragments that the chromatin is pulled down then what you are going to do is going to run a sequencing experiments and what you are going to do is what you are going to get is a read that means a sequence information so you you get a fragment of sequence and its information about its later like atgc or the sequence of it now you don't know what this sequence where are these sequence actually belong to like so you are going to align those sequences all possible fragments that you got you're going to align those fragments and see which genomic location that alignment is uh, overlapping with so this process is known as peak calling and you can reconstruct the signal so this is a chip signal that means this region in the genomic location this region in the genomic location and this region in the genomic location our transcription factor of interest so the protein of interest is actually binding okay so this is the overview of the um, the process now what we are going to do is going to learn about a bit more difficult part so one possibility is like you have a defined hypothesis that okay our whether our gene of interest bind to this particular gene or not you don't have a global question you have a local question whether our transcription factor is binding to gene a or gene x or not so what you are going to do you are going to pull down and from the pull down fraction you are going to amplify or you are going to look for your gene of interest and the way you look for your gene of interest is by chip qpcr so this is one of the other way by which you can detect the dna protein interaction but this is very targeted not a global level a local level okay so our next part which we wanted to discuss was techniques to detect protein protein interaction so if you guys are still with me and not too much exhausted we can learn about those techniques as well so you guys give me some in some some sort of indications that we should continue So I really want to give out all of the information and quite a lot of uh, lecture which is dense with concepts such that you guys can get maximum benefit out of these courses but at the same time if you need a more chilled out uh, discussion sessions or chilled out guidance trip uh, tricks you can always go to the unacademy plus platform where things are more chilled out and people know who are with me in that platform in a span of one month we have dramatically covered a hell lot of the syllabus at this at least 60 percent of the syllabus is covered within one month and it's not so stressful it's only one hour or half an hour of uh, class every day so it's easy and do remember i have a code ap10 it would give you a discount it would give you a discount not me a discount so it would be always good for you guys such that people who cannot afford they can also get a flavor of it and there are also open courses present in unacademy itself where i teach live but uh, you cannot interact with me in real time but you have the recorded podcast which you can use as a study material and these are totally um, information dense and concept dense okay since everybody is telling me to continue so we are going to continue with techniques to detect protein protein interaction okay so at least we learned three to four techniques by which we can understand dna protein interaction we are now going to talk about protein protein interaction so let's talk about it so first technique that we are going to talk about is immunoprecipitation followed by western blot or mass spec depending upon our question okay 
So this is our protein sample. So what we are going to add is an antibody coated bead provided that our protein sample and the protein that we want to detect is actually having an antibody against it. Otherwise, we cannot pull down the protein, right? So after antibody incubation, you wait for a time. And then what you do, you wait for a time. And that time is actually the time when this, pro this antibody coated bead is actually binding to the protein of interest. Then you can do a magnetic separation. If your beads are magnetic, it would be uh, concentrated into the region where the magnet is. You can get rid of the flow through, then elute it into the tubes. So let's say this pink protein is actually detected by this bead, I mean the antibody coated bead. And now we try to ask the question that what is coming down with this particular protein? What is pulled down along with it? Yeah, zoology people can always give IRT jam. It's, a, it's pretty common. Most of the people who are giving IRT jam are actually zoology students. They can give IRT jam provided they have enough amount of training. So that's why I was saying that there are like lot of resources that I'm providing. Many of them are free. Many of them are paid. And 1800 rupees per month is like nothing because you have spent so much of like uh, money in your class 12 or your tuitions or anything. Here in an academy plus platform, you're not only going to get student for a student like me i sorry the teachers like me i cannot consider myself as a teacher so anyway you can get educators like me and many other educators from whose video you can watch using the same amount of money as if like you pay one time and you go to multiple different classes you're eligible to go multiple different classes right yeah so in iit jam uh, plus class in an academy platform i am there and uh, I have like a big community. It's just like a classroom course, but you come online. We have tests, we have discussion series, we have doubt clearing sessions every three days. And we have like specific note materials, which are totally provided in free of cost. I'll get a, I'll give you a trailer if you guys are inter interested in that or not. So let's see. Now what happens is like, you want to know that with your particular protein of interest, whether you have a other stuff which is pulled down or not okay yeah so take take a subscription if you if you are in still in the first year so you can you guys can at least have an idea that uh, what type of things are going on if you take a year long subscription so there are also uh, classroom courses going to be starting from at the end of uh, february from march or sometime else Yes, I would be also there. Many other people would be also there. So it would totally give you a classroom kind of courses. And in classroom kind of courses, I would ensure that you would be provided with education. I cannot guarantee that whether you qualify IIT jam or qualify a, a sort of any exam. But in classroom courses, I can assure that I can provide you with lectures or education that none of your college teachers can provide. It would be really elaborated. And this is an open challenge to everybody. Okay, so this would be unique with ultra modern graphics, all our newly designed graphics by me with Nobel stories every day. That means whatever discoveries happen in the field would be taught every day. Not only it would boost your, your like exam or question solving skill at the end of the day, you would know the whole aspect. So if anybody is interested about it, so people can talk about uh, talk about that with their friends or anything. That if they are also interested or not and it's only at a cost of 1800 rupees per month if you take a one month subscription if you take a year long subscription it is like 873 rupees only which is even less than a thousand rupees no coaching provides you like that okay so we have our pull down fraction back getting back to our own story we pull down our protein of interest expecting that their interactors would be pulled down with it. And we're going to take the pull down fraction, run it on a SDS paid jail. After that, after we run it on the SDS paid jail for a long time, they would be sep separated along uh, their molecular weight, right? And then we blot it 
and try to probe for it in western blot so now let's look at it what we are going to see in the western blot okay so we are going to see definitely bands that's what we see in the western blot so let's try to look at what is the thing so forget about the input part that is basically a control so let's see in the illusion part or from the pull down fraction what we are going to get okay so what we are going to get get is like you have a anti a antibody and you have another anti b antibody and you are going to probe for b and a provided a, a, a is interacting with the b right here this particular print protein is expected to getting pulled down because you have antibody against the protein a no doubt it would be pulled down right so see here in this particular situation you do a experiment in a two way fashion here you detect you are detecting b but also you are detecting a by detecting a you are ensuring at least pull down has taken place if you don't see b there are two possibilities one possibility is like a is not interacting with b there is other possibilities that i don't see a band for b because a is not present there a is not pulled down and that's a negative control when you don't give a particular antibody against a so you see the anti a is not provided in this situation you don't have a band for a neither you have a band for b that means what a interacts with b and if a is not present b is also not present but if a is present b is definitely present so this is how you exactly look at the data in scientific uh, scientific data when you are going to publish your work or anything like that so this is unique about these lectures so in my unacademy course on everything i want to like put the lectures in such a way that you develop a research mindset you get yourself trained to look at data and how to look at research data research papers and you can just read it like this so this is one of the training that i'm providing and it's unique none of the educators is providing this thing at this particular moment okay so this particular band means our protein a is actually interacting with our protein b right so this was your targeted hypothesis that our protein a whether it is interacting with protein b or not right that is your targeted hypothesis but you could have a different hypothesis protein a can interact with c protein a can interact with d protein a can interact with x and many other protein it's not necessary that a has to interact with only one protein so just like you have a lot of friends this particular protein can interact with many partners right the way you can get a global picture of which are the interactors of a what you can do from the pull down fraction don't do a western blot perform a mass spectrometry experiment which would tell you a global aspect that what are the possible interactors of a provided that if they are interactors of a they would be pulled down with a so in the pull down of frac pull down fraction of a we are at least going to get those interactors so this is the whole basic principle based on which is uh, dependent okay next we are going to talk about is2 hybrid system is2 hybrid system is a very important system okay and especially it is used to detect protein protein interaction in vitro okay so you have a yeast now yeast normally has a galactose metabolism pathway and for that there is a gal gene which is important to be transcribed and it is transcribed by gal4 now gal4 has a activation domain and a dna binding domain which interacts with each other and the dna binding domain interacts with the dna activation domain helps to start the transcription so what you do you put a fish plasmid and a bait plasmid in a fish plasmid you are going to put you are going to put a portion of the dna a, a portion of the dna which is going to encode your protein of interest and then what you are going to have a reporter gene underlying a promoter or the gal promoter here now if they are interacting with each other so if you see these two proteins are interacting with each other which is the which is your question whether a is interacting with your b so you have creating you you, you have created a fusion protein 
with the activation domain of the GAL4 and the DNA binding domain of the GAL4, right? So if all are interacting, they are going to bind together and going to interact with the polymerase RNA pol 2 and that's how the transcription of the reporter gene would be there. Right? Actually, what is happening is like this. So here is your DNA binding region. Here is your activation domain. Activation domain is actually using a looping method to interact with the polymerase and the polymerase is the key thing which is helping in the transcription, right? Okay, but imagine they are not interacting with each other. This is not interacting with each other. So this interaction is not happening, right? That means what? This activation domain is not going to interact with the sort of uh, RNA polymerase as if there is a short circuit or this circuit is now open. It's not closed. So that's why you don't have a transcription activity going on. So the gal genes are not produced. So here we have used a reporter and this reporter very often what is used is a histidine reporter so normally these e strain is histidine i mean it, it cannot metabolize histidine only when you can uh, get rid of so it's henry right so are you an indian if you're indian then you only know that what is iit jam so iit jam is an exam which is a MSc level entrance exam to Indian Institute of Technologies, which are renowned institute, which provide uh, good training for MSc in biotechnology and a little bit of research. So that is what IIT JAM is. But people are preparing for IIT JAM, but these courses would aim to talk about several techniques and several other aspects which are important for biomedical researches. So it's an overall video, not specifically looking at IIT jam but at that some point of time we are going to also look at some IIT jam questions so these are some indian examinations if you are not in indian if i if i get get it correctly from your name henry okay so now we have our his reporter now the his reporter produce one enzyme which allows the particular um, yeast to metabolize histidine and if it's not able to metabolize histidine it would die so you can have one bait plasmid and you could have several fish. So you use your bait to catch several fish, right? So, and what you see in the plate, you look for the colonies. Look at these colonies. Here, you can see, okay. Anyway, so if you are Indian, you know now it is for IIT, IITs, right? The MSc level IIT entrance examination is known as IIT jam. Okay. Anyway, I am your educator who is teaching you, who is actually a PhD student doing his PhD in neuroscience and he has qualified IIT JAM twice with uh, single digit all India ranks and many other examinations with single digit all India rank but that doesn't define me. What defined me is about understanding the biology and propagating the positive vibe amongst the students and all. Okay, so getting back to our uh, point. That in these two cases we see there is an interaction with the protein A with some other proteins in this case a green protein or red protein here and that is why we are going to see a yeast colony forming because it is able to synthesize that uh, histidine synthesizing gene so it's a it is able to produce that reporter and as a result these are metabolic reporter that is used there are many other reporters which is used as well and what you see is link other cases where there is no interaction none of the cases the colony is produced because the reporter gene which was under the GAL4 was not transcribed in these cases. And that is how we can understand how two proteins are interacting but using a nice strategy of bait and fish plasmids, we can really fish for or look for multiple interactors of a particular protein. So this is the overall idea about uh, ES2 hybrid system. Next we talk about shortly fluorescence resonance energy transfer it is again another technique by which you can detect protein protein interaction in vitro so you have your two protein protein a and protein b your simple job is to understand protein a is interacting with protein b or not you have used a fusion protein which is a cfp and a yfp cfp with protein a, a yfp with protein b now you have transfected that into a mammalian cell and 
so these are not e coli plasmids what we are using right now now these plasmids are actually a mammalian expression vector mostly they are shuttle vectors they can propagate in e coli and mammalian vectors as well but these are not something exclusively for e coli mostly the expression plasmid these days which are used these are shuttle vectors if you want to know more about these things i can uh, assure you a, a more detailed course is going on in an academy plus platform you can take a subscription for only 1800 rupees per month uh, that gives you not four days a week but it gives you 30 days a week of teaching okay so you get like that many hours of uh, teaching per month at a cost of like 1800 rupees okay now we are going to transfect it into this particular cells and then look it under the microscope now the way fluorescent work is like you shine a light and then if it's a fluorescent specimen it is going to emit another wavelength now what happens is if another protein yfp is present in the near vicinity then the fluorescent might be quenched and so either quenched or this particular fluorophore would be excited so if they are very close to each other so there is a resonance energy transfer so we excited cfp we are going to see a cyan fluorescence instead of that we are going to see a yfp emission range that means interaction has happened so the proximity of the interaction is actually told by this kind of assay so it's a proximity detection assay you might say but again you have to artificially put your construct this fret constructs into your cells so it is not a in vitro assay unless and until you make a transgenic mouse line or a transgenic drosophila line then you can perform these assays in vivo as well so really any assays can have a in vitro or in vivo flavor based on how you design your assay so let's not waste any more time and we are going to talk about some questions that are asked in iit gem and whether after these uh, classes or lectures whether we are able to get some idea or get some positive hold on those or not okay so let's let's try to solve some questions so here is a question which was asked in iit jam 2016 it says match the column a with column b and this is a frequent type of question which are asked in all of the iit jam okay okay so right now what you are going to do is going to first take a pen and going to match the following so it's a east to hybrid system and in 20 minutes before we learned about east to hybrid system right so east to hybrid system is a method by which we can detect protein protein interaction in vitro so now we are going to see whether where we have a in vitro protein protein interaction we don't find we have also looked at electrophoretic mobility shift assay which is a in vitro dna protein interaction so we say q is actually matching with 3 then chromatin immunoprecipitation followed by sequencing or qpcr that's a in vivo dna protein interaction right it's a in vivo dna protein interaction now nuclear magnetic resonance which i have not covered yet in this lecture but i would be covering these things in a different lecture in that you would be seeing uh, that wait a second i have to put my ipad on charge otherwise i would be like disconnected wait a second huh? okay so the nuclear magnetic resonance is actually used to detect the protein structure okay and finally we are left with east to hybrid system which is just in this case have they have written protein protein interaction but it's actually protein protein interaction in vitro so they have not written it i don't care but anyway the option is matching right so basically p4 s2 so we would look for p4 s2 p4 s2 p4 s2 we have two options here b or c we have to look at b or c and then here we have chromatin immunoprecipitation which is like r2 so r2 chromatin immunoprecipitation 
sorry r1 sorry it was r1 chromatin immunoprecipitation is a in vivo dna protein interaction right so here is our r1 so this is our particular answer right this is our particular answer okay we move on to another uh, example where people have seen uh, questions like this so which of the following particular uh, column 1 is matching with the functions in the column 2 so techniques in one side usage in other side so you have circular dichroism ion exchange chromatography immunoprecipitation that we talked right now immunoprecipitation could be chromatin immunoprecipitation or immunoprecipitation only so immunoprecipitation what is it is used for identifying protein protein interaction at least we know this thing right so 3 is pairing with q so we would look for 3 is pairing with q so here we have a q3 and q3 is only option present so in this case we really solve it quickly but this is not a proper arrangement of the choices that they should have done but anyway the choices are actually better than these so just to give you a quick idea x-ray crystallography is a very in interesting technique and important technique to get an atomic resolution of the protein structure both nmr and x-ray crystallography can give us that example okay okay then we come to circular dichroism which is specially important for secondary structure determination now and ultimately we know that ion exchange chromatography any chromatographic technique is actually a protein purification technique so we are going to quickly mark it as a protein purification technique right separation of the protein mixtures so all of these things are now marked and now you can so what are, for these kind of question what happens is like you guys really get stressed and okay you think you know it and most of the cases you don't make mistake of combining those things you make mistake on choosing those things okay so you are going to take a pen and going to write it first in your copy or the rough sheet that is provided and then going to click on the answer otherwise it would be a death trap to make mistake as well but this is these are the most scoring part of iit jam at the same time so now what you can do is like do several things now i'm going to give you some advices at the end of these uh class so i can see a lot of you guys are there still with me yeah you guys are still with me so yeah uh, in next in next 15 minutes i'm going to give you some uh tips so let's see what happens so i know that that the enzymes these kind of techniques these are always asked in our examinations right so what i have done in my time when i was preparing i was preparing a particular notes like this so here what i did see here i first chosen enzymes which are used in molecular biology right so i have written that and i have like written the important aspects or important function of them because most of the questions are like this enzyme this function this enzyme they are used so this is my handwriting and i have like used these of all of these things which i have already shared with you guys but these kind of share notes are available in an academy plus platform not in the open platform so you can see how terminal deoxynucleotide transferase and many other enzymes which we wouldn't would not miss in a plus class but here is just a overall view nick translation which we didn't discuss today but all of these things i have uh, listed for my own so what you can do take the same path and do it this would give you a quick revision way by which you can retrieve the information so when i'm talking about all of these informations these are remaining in your head but the problem is um sometimes it goes out of your head and you don't revise it now if you put a label on your book and mark it it's still fine but sometimes what happens is like these informations are disconnected if the informations are together it would be really easy for you to quickly revise it without even wasting a time you sit for 10 minutes 15 minutes you revise it everything is in front of you you have an imprint of these whole information in your brain so though i don't support mugging up information but i'm saying that these information would help you to associate association and mugging up is a different thing okay so this is how i used to do it so if you guys have any question i'm ready to answer so can you can you tell me some 
question that you ha have so in leninger biochemistry the chapter 9 has dna cloning basics uh, they have um, dna based information technologies which was a inform very important chapter in my opinion right so i learned this chapter from leninger and it was pretty useful and from that i actually made my own notes such that i can do it in my exam so this was my strategy so what do you guys say you guys are you guys having some questions tell me guys this is your opportunity to ask i can tell you give you tips the other thing i used to do always is something like this so these are known as the flashcards okay so for example what you are going to see here is a flashcard so this flashcard talks about affinity chromatography so it's just a one page stuff but at the same time what is happening is like this page has all the necessary information concepts and all the thing that we need to know about affinity chromatography so yeah this is it so you have like pretty much all the information about these things so all of these flashcards that i have used and i uh, encourage people to use all of these uh, in uh, co uh, concept dense stuff is only available in the unacademy plus platform not in the open platforms so if you really want to take these things these are provided free of cost there or maybe at a nom nominal cost so you guys can take it so that pretty much summarizes what we have learned today so far and we are la at the last uh, 10 minutes of our lecture so what do you guys say how did you like this lecture did you guys like it what is your take on that are you guys still with me Guys, you guys are with me, or what happened? Okay, if you guys are not with me, still fine. We can look at one more technique in the next uh, 10 minutes of time, which is SDS page and Western blot. So, it's also an important technique day to day in biochemistry lab and molecular biology lab. This is readily used. So let's talk about this technique first. So SDS page. SDS page stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate, sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So it's a particular um, electrophoresis technique as you can understand. Now using SDS page, you can separate proteins just like using agarose page, you can separate DNA using sds page you can separate proteins so somebody has a question so let me take the question can you please give some information regarding antibiotic inhibition of replication transcription and translation maybe in some other video lecture so these things are scheduled at february there would be one particular lecture on molecular biology especially on transcription and gene expression regulation so in that particular class we are going to cover all of these things okay yeah okay so that's pretty much it now we are going to talk about sds page so sds page is a technique by which you can separate proteins based on their molecular weight and size so let's see how does it works so you have two gels one gel is called resolving gel also called as running gel and another gel is known as stacking gel also known as um, the initial portion of the gel so this gel is a hybrid of two gels the stacking gel is actually having larger pores lower ionic strength and the ph of this gel or the buffer which is used to make the gel is 6.8 but the ph to make the resolving gel is 8.8 .8, and the percentage of polyacrylamide gel is also very different in these cases in the resolving section versus the stacking section okay so 
what is the primer like what, what what is the raw ingredient by which you make the gel so it's nothing but acrylamide so acrylamide gets combined with the bisacrylamide and forming a polyacrylamide chain which is a i mean like a moiety right a framework through which uh, our protein actually pass right a meshwork so now invest in investigators are able to change the concentration of the gel to alter the pore size for example here we have two gel with two different pore size now if we have a big protein to separate we would use the gel with bigger pore size and if we have a gel with very small pore size we would use uh, we, we would use it to purify proteins which are smaller in size right okay let's see the first step first step you get to extract the protein so you get kind going to take the cell lysate you are going to add sds and beta mark up to ethanol which would work like a denaturant and incubate it for some time in a particular temperature now before sds treatment you have several charges on the protein because you have glutamate residues lysine residues both positive and negative charges present in the protein right but all of these charges would be masked by a coat of SDS, which is a negatively charged. So now it is uniformly coated with a negative SDS charge. Now you can clearly understand if it is negatively charged, it would move from a negative electrode to a positive electrode, right? A cathode to anode. So then you run your gel, you load your gel, and then you run the gel. And you have a marker by which you, which tells you that the gel is running. So let's see what happens, what are the ionic species while you run the gel. Remember, we have a running buffer while we are running the gel, like we have TAE buffer in case of acarose gel electrophoresis. Here, the buffer is called trisglycine buffer. Okay, so the samples would are expected to run from negative to positive, but remember, we have a pH of 6.8 in the upper resolving gel. So the chlorine ion first move very quickly. It's a single ion, it's a smaller size, it moves very fast. Now then, our protein of interest which is coated by the SDS is moving slowly, slowly. And at the end, who is moving? Our glycine ion. But the problem is glycine at pH 6.8 behaves like what? A cation, right? It behaves like a cation. That's why. Why it is cation? At pH 6.8, which is acidic pH, there would be a lot of protons present in the media. And all of its zwitter ionic charges would be masked and COO minus group would be COOH group right now and you would have more positive charges. So it would behave like a cation at when the pH is 6.8. So now it's a plus charge stuff. So it would be at the end, it is hardly moving, right? But still it is moving with the influence. Now later what happens is like the proteins actually move in between these two species and they move like a tight band and get stacked up on the starting line. So it looks like a starting line of a race. So this function of these uh, stacking gel is to put the protein on their mark and now they're on their mark. So it's the time to say, let's set go. So now they're going to run on the resolving part. Okay, the pH of the running gel is now what? 8.8, .8, which is in a basic range. At this particular range, the glycine would behave like an anion. So both glycine and chlorine ion, which are very small, they would run quickly and fast and move away from the gel. Now our protein would be moving like a slowly, more slowly, and according to their size, molecular weight and size, they are going to move and get resolved in the gel, right? So after running the gel, we are going to stop the gel. And then this is how an unstained gel look like. And these gels are actually performed by me. So I, I, can, I can show you these gels. So this is how an unstained gel look like. Then you try to stain it with something. And you, you need to see the bands, right? So you, you can stain it with Kumasi blue, which is a blue colored dye. And it would stain the band. So you can see there are so many bands which are now stained with this Kumasi blue. And if you know the molecular weight of this ladder provided, you can get to understand that your protein of interest, the band that you are trying to understand whether that is present or not. Right? That is how a SDS page works. So that pretty much explains how SDS page works, right? Now the problem with SDS page is several. First of all, a protein, if it is 
not a monomer if it is a complex protein of several subunits so all of these subunits would be actually denatured right now then a problem is like sds page can tell you okay there is a band present but it, it is possible that there are many other bands of same molecular weight for example a protein having a molecular weight 73 kilo dalton is almost indistinguishable from a protein with 75 kilo dalton molecular weight so in those minute changes we cannot say we're going to we we cannot like get that kind of re resolution in this particular gel but how do we do that like how do we can get rid of that kind of situation so in order to understand that we need to understand the gel electrophoresis in second dimension the 2d electrophoresis right so that's a good part people are saying that or we can cut the 2d electrophoresis gel or cut the band expected region and we are going to put it in mass spec right and in some other open class, we are going to talk about 2D gel electrophoresis, Western blot, and many other aspects. So this is the last time, like there are two more minutes left to, the, to end the class. If you guys have a specific question, you guys can ask me right now before we end the class. I hope you enjoyed this class and this class was helpful. If you know somebody who can afford education and can't provide very costly uh, subscription to many things, so you can also share them. And you can also, if you like the lecture and you think, you you your friend would be get benefited by this kind of lecture you can also tell them about the academy plus platform where we discuss a lot of thing and only plus students can tell us that how much we have covered in a span of one month it's humongous so yeah so we're going to talk about uh 2d gel electrophoresis in one other day and it would be a scheduled class which would be which would be a part two of these same thing biotechnics so see you guys sometime Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop the streaming process right now and say goodbye to you guys. And it's one hour 30 minutes of dense packed class. We have looked at several biological techniques, how they are used, what type of questions are asked, how we can tackle those questions, where to read from, what to read from, and all of these things. Okay, so I'm stopping this streaming and goodbye. Good night.